Welcome to Tony at 12. I'm Tony LeBlanc and today I'm in conversation with Professor Claire Jowett who specialises in it specializes in Renaissance studies at the University of East Anglia. And we're going to talk about the last voyage of the Gloucester in 1682. Claire, how nice to see you. Uh, brilliant to be here. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. Now, I understand that this could be more important than the Mary Rose. Uh, well, we like to think so, but we obviously acknowledge how important the Mary Rose is for 16th century maritime history. If we can do half as good a job with the Gloucester as the Maritime Rose has done, then we'll be happy. The Gloucester is very interesting, isn't it? Because it, it was built whilst there was still a monarchy, Charles I. It then went to the Commonwealth and then back to the monarchy, presumably in the form of Charles II. So it's sort of spanned several years of history that's that's almost right tony i'm so sorry to correct you no please it's actually do a commonwealth ship right so it's commissioned uh in 1652 which is under the commonwealth built in 1654 uh first uh, intended for the anglo-dutch war uh, and you're absolutely right then in 1660 um it does become the possession of charles the second, yeah. Okay. It does span both the Commonwealth and the monarchic uh, periods. Um, was there anything exceptional about it in terms of size or anything like that? Um, it's a third-rate speaker-class frigate, and the speaker is a new class of ship. It's a large ship. It's a, a ship that is um, uh, very well armed, between 50 and 60 guns, and it does make a real difference uh, to, you know, amphibious maritime campaigns in the 1650s, because the Dutch, I already said there was a war going on when it was commissioned, um, actually have much smaller ships. So having available a whole series of speaker class frigates, of which the Gloucester is one, means that the Dutch change how they conduct their war and need to build bigger ships too. There were several Dutch wars, weren't there? There were, there were, but it, this was built for the 1650s one. Um, but yes, the Gloucester takes part in the in the wars in the 1660s and in the 1670s. It's yeah. a very bellicose period of history, and the Gloucester is fully active in all those campaigns. Um, how many crew? Um, it's rated to have uh, about 210 crew at times of peace up to 270 or so in times of war. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's, it's a big ship, uh, you know, 700 and, and, and odd tons. Uh, it's, it's, you know, heavily armed. It's a, a fortress at sea. And it was decommissioned in 1678 as a result of the battle damage against the Dutch. That's correct. Um, it was by about 1672, mm -hmm. uh, 1673, it's really struggling with leaks. It okay. goes in for a refit into Portsmouth and then it doesn't emerge for a number of years later. And that's simply because it's really expensive. Uh, the Stuart monarchy is overextended in terms of wanting to build new ships all the time. And that means there ends up being a queue to get ships refitted. So between 1670 is comprehensively uh, refitted. Uh, it's almost like a new ship by 1682 when okay. it's on its last final tragic voyage. Yes. Yeah, so what was the final destination, Claire, for, for it on this voyage? Well, it was intended to be going from uh, Portsmouth to pick up uh, James, Duke of York and Albany off Margate Road off the coast of Kent and then take him and his court up to Edinburgh and then to return back again. This is in May 1682 with his pregnant wife, Mary of Medina and uh, James's daughter by his first marriage, Princess Anne, later Queen Anne, so that James and the family could reside permanently at the English court. James has been in exile after the exclusion crisis, uh, but 
from about 1679, uh, most of the time in Scotland, but by 1682, early in 1682, that political crisis is, is subsiding and he's been allowed briefly back to the court, uh, landing at Great Yarmouth, then going to Newmarket to the races. He and his brother love the races, don't we all? Got, got their priorities. In, in the yes. <laughs> they got their priorities <laughs> right from that point of view. So why did it sink and where did it sink? It sinks off the, the Norfolk coast uh, on the early in the morning of the 6th of May, 1682. It's been at sea for a couple of days and the night of the 5th of May, as um, the ship is approaching, it's in its sailing with a number of small, smaller yachts and a number of smaller frigates. So it's, it's part of a small fleet. Uh, they're approaching the North Norfolk sandbanks and there is a big old argument about what the best course to take to na um, navigate safely uh, all the way through to Scotland. So the pilot, James Ayres, uh, advocates what's called the Colliers uh, route, the coastal route, uh, a bit slower. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, ship's um, officers are suggesting a deep sea route, uh, sailing far out. Again, it would take that much more time. So there's a debate, and, and I think James, Duke of York, intervenes here. Quick thing away from the court having been allowed back in, he doesn't want, you know, uh, fermenting rebellion against him to, to start again. So a, a sort of a compromise course ends up being uh, followed. Um, and at four o'clock in the morning, the pilot thinks that they're past all danger. And, and remember, once you're you know, out at sea, you can't navigate by landmarks. No. Uh, we don't have longitude in this period or accurate measuring, measuring of longitude. At four o'clock in the morning, the pilot thinks they're past all danger. He goes to bed. At 90 minutes later, very unfortunately, they hit a sandbank. Um, the smaller ships are able to sail, the yachts are able to sail uh, you would have been able to sail over it because they've got, you know, a, a less deep hull. Yeah. But the Gloucester is a substantial ship and very unfortunately it hits. So it literally got stuck in the mud. <laughs> it got stuck on the sand. Yeah. Um, yes, it's three fathoms of water that are over the sandbank. Um, and it's just that the, 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 the keel is, is just, you know, it's the, the hull is just deeper than that. Uh, the rudder catches on the sandbank, it bumps along the sandbank, then the, uh, the rudder comes loose and water goes very quickly into the ship. It's made eight, nine feet of water really quickly. But the, if the ship had have stayed on the sandbank, the tragedy wouldn't have been so significant because they'd have had time to, to evacuate, to abandon uh, safely. But actually the ship keeps on going and ends up in deep water, which is where it sinks. And right. this all happens ever so quickly. It's underwater in less than an hour. That's incredible, isn't it? And, and, and what, what was the situation with regard to survivors? Well, we don't have a muster list. So we don't actually know how many people were on board, mm -hmm. but we think there are an awful lot. It's probably over 200 crew. James doesn't travel light in any sense. Right. So he's got um, a large number, a large retinue with him, a lots of significant individuals plus their servants. So we're probably looking at in excess of 300 350 people on board we think there may even possibly have been tents on board because yeah. you know the accommodation was so cramped um we at maximum 250 people lose their lives probably somewhere in the middle so it's a very significant tragedy what about the king did he get off he did. Yeah. Yeah. James Duke York gets, gets, gets away. Um, he's reluctant to abandon ship because uh, this ship is worth an awful lot of money. It's looking fantastic. It's just been refitted. This is mm. an expensive piece of kit. Uh, but under persuasion by John Churchill, later Duke of Marlborough, and another chap, George Legg, who is Master of Ordnance, James is you know, very strongly encouraged. He leaves um, through the window from the captain's cabin, um, gets onto uh, one of the a little boats, and then is rowed away 
uh, to uh, an awaiting yacht, the Mary yacht, and he carries on uh, almost immediately to get to Scotland. And that's important in a way. It may seem hard hearted, but it's it's also important that the rumour that he's drowned yeah. doesn't take hold in, in, in the country. Yeah. And of course, it's uh, we're talking about days where there was no communication as such at all, was there really? Apart from, you know, letters being carried on horseback or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So the yeah. ship makes really good time to get to Scotland. As I've said, James, his wife is pregnant what he doesn't want is her to hear yeah you know that he's dead as well and that that's yeah. you know they're hoping they don't have a male heir they're hoping that the baby that she's carrying will be a boy it's actually a, a girl um but but you know that's obviously not known at the time now there are recorded courts martial on this one aren't there There are, you're quite right. There are two courts martial. Uh, the first is brought against the pilot, James Ayres. Um, mm -hmm. James, as he's writing, you know, uh, immediately after the tragedy is, is, you know, absolutely furious about what's happened, takes no responsibility for it at all, and indeed advocates that the pilot should be hanged. Uh, that thankfully doesn't happen, but the first courts martial is brought against him on the 6th of June, 1682, he's found guilty um, and he is sentenced to perpetual imprisonment, but actually he's out within a year. Uh, the chap presiding at the, uh, at the trial, uh, a, a brilliantly named chap, Captain Haddock, um, actually <laughs> is quite, it almost <coughs> seems to be defending heirs. Yeah. And at that trial, the captain of the Mary yacht, the yacht that had rescued James and taken him to Scotland, um, had said that against Admiralty orders, instead of ordering a cannon to be fired, he'd ordered jack flags to be waved. And that actually gets him into trouble. So a week later, a court martial is taken against him, a chap called Captain Gunman, and he's also found guilty. Um, he's relieved of his command. But really interestingly, within a few days, he is out. He is the, the, the Mary yacht is in many ways the, the royal taxi of the yeah. time. It's been used to sort of zipping about with um, important people on it. And the king, King Charles, intervenes to get gunmen out. Do you, were, were people aware of, of the wreck's position from the time it sank through to the 21st century? Or did it go through a period of, you know, nothing much happening? Um, I think that, yes, in many ways, that's true. It's a cause celebre, a sensation yeah. of the time. Um, you know, the captaining of the ship of state is a political metaphor that, you know, then as now... Uh, has considerable kind of power, but, you know, James survives. Um, yeah. In 1685, he does inherit the throne. There is a rebellion against him. He loses the throne three years later um, when his daughter Mary and her husband and also James's nephew um, uh, invade England in what's called the Glorious Revolution. And that's the start of parliamentary democracy in yeah. many ways. <clears throat> so there's a sort of a Whig history that largely forgets about, you know, James the second. He's not a popular king or seen as a good king. Um, and I think that contributes to the fact that this uh, to a, a, an extent has become a footnote in history, an interesting footnote but actually the larger politics which we are now exploring I think are important and and really delighted to be you know amplifying them because it's a period of history that we do forget about we know Elizabeth I we know Henry and his wives we know Queen Victoria but we get a bit lost in the later 17th century and the Dutch effectively had the last word <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. The Dutch are, you know, are are, are the, the Britain's competitors, yes. in, you know, yeah. for overseas territorial expansion. And this is a, a, as I say, a bellicose, but also, you know, a, a period of history where colonial desires by European nation states are are very powerful and very mm. strong, with a a whole legacy um, that that is still with us.
yeah yeah so what uh what sort of was the point where the project began in terms of the research and everything else well the project for uea for the university of east anglia began in 2019 yeah. when uh norfolk music the vice chair at the university of east anglia who spoke to the pro vice chancellor for the faculty and myself and we became in involved but it dates back much longer than that with julian and lincoln barnwell the yeah. discoverers of the rec site who for uh, four years and 5,000 nautical miles had been searching for the Gloucester. There's a famous book of shipwrecks by the Larns and Lincoln Barnwell was inspired by the entry on the Gloucester. Uh, it took place in what he considered, you know, the sinking of his backyard. You know, the Barnwells had been diving that area since they were, since they were young and it had the magic word for Lincoln Cannon. Um, so they've been looking, you know, uh, for, 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 for a number of years until they discovered it in 2007. And they found the bell and the bell had on it the name of the ship. The bell. Yeah. Uh, the bell had on it the date 1681. Yeah. So yeah. that conclusively proved that this was the Gloucester rather than <clears throat> another 17th century wreck in, in very close proximity for Kent, which sank in 1672. So that 1681 date was really important. And yeah. it's the sort of the beating heart of the ship as well in, in many ways. Maybe the last things that people were, were hearing would be the bell clanging as they were trying to, you know, abandon, trying to make themselves safe. Fair. Would you describe it as a fairly compact site, the area in which the remains are, are currently lying? Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> because yes. um, you're probably I aware of the fact. I have to say this. I'm not a maritime archaeologist. <laughs> no, 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 no. But no. the, but <laughs> the project's working is. with Maritime Archaeological Trust. Yeah. And Gary Momba, who's the director of that, um, has uh, said that the site is 30 by 50 metres. Uh, so, yes, it is a... a, a and not too a, deep. A bit of scatter beyond that, but it is a compact site. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You see, we, we've got one um, an Elizabethan wreck off Alderney. And, of course, we have these fierce currents, the tides and everything else. And, and the whole thing spread over, you know, a great area. And, of course, it keeps changing every time, you know, the, the current carries it a bit further. So you're, you're good from that point of view. You, you noticed in my notes, I told you about the fact that when they started retrieving cannons here in Alderney, one of them went to York for conservation. And uh, we have a situation where they're having a look at it and it starts smoking and it was already primed. <laughs> wow. So wow. you got to be amazing. a bit careful from that point of view. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we I, to... I saw in Alderney Maritime Museum that, that, that two amazing cannon had been brought up from that yes. 1592 yeah, yeah, wreck. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. cannon have as yet been brought up from the Gloucester wreck site. It's been uh, primarily, it's been surface rescue archaeology. Um, but but certainly um, the archaeologists and the, the Barnwells have said that they can see, and we've seen pictures of a whole broadside of cannon. Yeah. Uh, down Which is good. Inside, um, um, underneath. The, the North Sea, we know, is a pretty cruel sea, isn't it, in terms of the fact it takes lots of Yorkshire with it every year. <laughs> Have you had problems, with, you know, with the wreck site or is that fairly stable? No, it's not stable at all. You're, you're quite right that there are sand waves uh, that uh, the archaeologists consider will have covered over the wreck and then bits uncovered. There is scouring going on. It's a very dynamic that by the archaeologists to be highly at risk that an artifact might be uncovered um, and then it's gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw in the excellent brochure that you're using a scientific system. I've probably got the uh, pronunciation wrong. Photogrammetry? Photogrammetry, that's quite right. Yeah, okay. That this is lots and lots of different photographs that are taken to make up a composite picture. And a survey was done in 2019 
and then again last summer in 2022 and again the archaeologists you know can see then how the site is changing and where the scouring is going on where the site is most vulnerable um, so it's a really important tool for archaeologists to monitor and manage a wreck site what's the state of the hull has it broken up substantially or um, I, I think until there is an excavation, that's You're not difficult going to, be able to, to yeah. say with certainty. Um, I think the hope is that substantial portions of the hull may still be there. You know, for a historian, the thought that, um, you know, two or three metres depth of archaeology is under the sand blanketed, you know, anaerobically preserved. Yeah. Um, and the stern part of the ship would have been where the captain's cabin was, of course, which would have been where James, Duke of York and his court would have been residing. So the, the thought of a royal court at sea kind of captured in time is is incredible. But I think... The first step, you know, if there is an excavation um, and, and that's not, you know, uh, timetabled at the moment, it's not at that point, would be to do a, a, a trench, you know, starboard to port to see the depth of the archaeology. Mm. Yeah. But as I say, it's surface rescue archaeology to date and about 530 artefacts have been recovered through that process. And I understand within those artefacts some bottles of wine. Indeed. <clears throat> Out of those 520, 530 artefacts, 149 are wine bottles or parts of wine bottles. 49 of them have some contents, 29 of them have full contents and are sealed still. So that means that the ullage, which is my new favourite word, which means the air between the wine and the cork is still captured. So there is not only wine, but there is pre-industrial 17th century air still in these <laughs> bottles. Well, that's got to be good, hasn't it? <laughs> Do you have any problems managing the site in terms of security or anything like that? Uh, I think eyes are on it all, all the time. Um, but yeah, it's a vulnerable, you know, archaeological sites are, are vulnerable. Yeah, sure. and it's important that they are, you know, going forward protected. It's in international waters. Yeah. And that also means that it's, you know, that's a, another wrinkle. Um, but it's a long way out. It's I was going to say, a long way out. if it's in international waters, it's 12 miles plus, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. And, the, the, the archaeologists and the Barnwells are very keen that this, the site is not, you know, made vulnerable by talking too in too much detail yeah. about exactly where it is. Yeah, I can understand that. That's obviously important. What about the ultimate aim? So, I mean, obviously, if you haven't excavated the hull at this point, it's a bit difficult to know what's there. But would you like to see a sort of Mary Rose type set up in terms of, um, you know, a museum? I would love to. Of course I would. The thought of um, a, a 17th century travelling court with all the artefacts of a 17th century travelling court is unprecedented. The stories that this ship can tell um, are, I think, amazing and really important. It's an important almost moment in our history. Mm. But the ship in its, itself is really important. It's a, a 17th century speaker class Cromwellian frigate that saw such distinguished service. It's a really important ship for Britain's island story. And I would love to see it as part of a, a museum um, in, in due course. If, if it did happen, where do you think the location should be? Well, Great Yarmouth is the closest <laughs> port yeah. to where the tragedy happened. Given Great Yarmouth's proud maritime history, uh, that would seem entirely appropriate. I think it's absolutely a, a Norfolk story mm. uh, and a story that's important for Norfolk. So I would absolutely like to see it within so 
So what's the score in terms of um, funding for something like this? Well, it's going to take a lot of a lot of fundraising, um, yeah. philanthropic funding. There is a Gloucester 1682 charitable trust that is fundraising to uh, secure the future of the Gloucester in, in due course. Um, there are ongoing, you know, negotiations about what that exactly what that future is going to look like. UEA is doing. We are funded at the moment by the Leverhulme Trust to write a cradle to grave history. Myself mm -hmm. and a colleague, Dr. Yeah. Ben Redding, are writing a history of the warship from its inception to, you know, it, it's our also be doing philanthropic funding and there is a, a just giving page at the University of East Anglia if anybody was so minded to well you know, we'd better we better, uh, better talk about that before we close the interview haven't we <laughs> <laughs> but what about the national lottery is that you know heritage sites I, I I would hope that there will be a whole series of applications yeah. made to appropriate yeah. places yeah. as the project moves into those kind of stages but it's it's one step at a, a time and you know from the university's point of view from my point of view as a maritime historian i want to do justice to the history of this ship but also all those people whose lives were touched by it mm. both the people that that died of course but also the the people whose lives were affected um, you know, all the wives that lost their their major breadwinners, you know, yeah. had ripple effects um, that it's really important, I think, to to capture fully. Yeah, very much so. So um, if it all comes up to pass and if you're in a situation <clears throat> where you get your museum, <clears throat> excuse me, do you think we'll still uh, have you EA involvement? <clears throat> Will you see it through? I very much hope so, yeah. uh, because, you know, the university certainly thinks that this is, an, you know, an important story for Norfolk. We take our civic responsibilities uh, really seriously. We're also really passionate about our coastal communities. Yeah. Um, and that means the long durée history of them as well as the future. So I absolutely think that the university would like to be upfront and central to you know the next stages of the Gloucester story you know I'm tapping out the, the hope the 17th century life of the ship you know we can all play a part in the 21st century life of the ship well that's been most interesting Claire just remind us about the fundraising page uh, yes, it, it's a giving to UEA. If people look up giving to UEA, they yeah. will find the fundraising there. There is also the Gloucester 1682 Charitable Trust. If people would uh, uh, be interested in finding out more about the, that, that work as well. And I guess before we sign off, we'd better mention the Duke of Gloucester, hadn't we? He's involved. We had. <laughs> yes, the, mm. we were absolutely privileged to have the Duke of Gloucester and his wife, the Duchess coming to the exhibition at Norwich Castle um, and uh, to be part of the, the, the team that showed them the different exhibits. And uh, we were again very privileged that the, that the Duke wrote a forward for our catalogue for the current exhibition, which is on at Norwich Castle uh, until the 10th of <coughs> September. Robert so if you haven't seen it, please do come along. Robert McDowell. Um who very kindly made the introduction, <clears throat> lent me a copy of the catalogue, and it's a very fine document. Really enjoyed what, reading that. Thank uh, you. That's in my wife, so there we are. Claire, it's been a great pleasure and privilege to talk to you. Thank you so much for sparing me some of your time. Perhaps we can have another look at it in a year's time. That would be brilliant. Love yeah. to. Yeah. So many, many thanks, Claire, and, um, you know, really appreciate your participation.